To continue our theme of bureaucracy, we next turn to the various ways in which bureaucracy can be understood or seen. The first one is the rational choice model. According to this model, bureaucrats operate based on clear and noble rules. They also take cost and benefits into consideration before they decide on a given course of action. There is also a fairly strict hierarchy in a bureaucratic organization, with people at the top giving orders and those below them following it. And finally, there's a corollary of sorts that this particular organization, that, or this particular model of an organization that seems to be so rational, so rule-based, so analytical and hierarchical, in fact leads to an irrational outcome, that being herd mentality, and most people seeing themselves as cogs in a machine, ready to execute their specific function without reflecting about moral consequences of their decisions. So, does this model reflect reality? In the 20th century, this has been the dominant model, the textbook model of bureaucracy, and to a great extent, uh, we should say that uh, it reflects reality. Uh, certainly. Uh, clear and noble rules, uh, something that uh, bureaucratic organizations in the modern state have tried to strive for. Uh, clear and noble rules is opposite of a random whim of, uh, of a ruler. So organizations want to operate based on rules that are clear, that can be known. They might not be known to all of us, but they could be known if we wanted to. We could read them and understand them. And if we couldn't do that, then at least our lawyers presumably could read it and understand it for us. Um, and cost-benefit analysis and hierarchy seem to be present. So if you look at the surface uh, of bureaucratic organizations, this model seems to be very appealing. It seems to be almost like an end-all and be-all of understanding what bureaucracies are all about. But if we dig a little bit deeper and become a little bit more skeptical, we go to the acquisitive model. And this particular model sees uh, bureaucracies as essentially selfish and self-aggrandizing. Uh, what they want, according to the acquisitive model, is more money. They also want more staff. They also want to increase their sphere of influence, their jurisdiction. Then they promote their importance relentlessly to Congress and the media. So presumably no organization wants to go out of business or even to reduce its current scope. So it will always say, give us more money. We need more money to serve the public. Or, or, and or we need to hire more people. So bureau bureaucracies are selfish and self-aggrandizing. The monopolistic model argues that bureaucracies operate as any organization that has a monopoly would operate. That is to say, uh, they don't have to care about being efficient because if they're not efficient, what's going to happen to them? They're not going to go out of business because they're the only game in town. Uh, so this means that uh, our operations are inefficient. This means that the cost to taxpayer is excessive. This means that the service is probably subpar because they don't have to please. Bureaucratic organizations do not have to please their customers. And uh, some have suggested that privatization, partial or complete, is a solution to bureaucratic monopolies. The garbage can model is the one that is radically opposed to the rational choice model. This is the model of muddling through. This is where bureaucrats try to come up with specific solutions to specific problems, one problem, one circumstance at a time. This model says that there's no grand plan for an organization. Organizations kind of bumble aimlessly, seeking narrow solutions to specific problems. Solutions tend to be adopted as a result of trial, trial and error. That's why it's a garbage can model. You try something, it doesn't work, you throw it away. Finally, you find a solution that works, you adopt that solution. But lo and behold, soon thereafter, the solution stops working. Why does it stop working? Because circumstances change. And once circumstances change, what used to work 
no longer works. So you discard that solution and the whole process starts again. Some key terms, spoil system comes from the phrase to the victor beyond the spoils. Uh, this used to be the dominant system of making appointments to bureaucratic organizations before the reform in the late 19th century. Pendleton Act was passed in 1883 by Congress and it put 10% of the federal bureaucracy under the so-called merit system. A hundred years uh, after the act was passed, it would be amended multiple times, and by now uh, about 90% of the federal civilian bureaucracy is under the merit system. So the merit system is when you get a job based on your merit, and not because you're connected to someone who won an election and you help them win an election. So instead of using cronyism and uh, friends and, and having supporters being appointed by president, uh, now you are appointed based on your education, work experience, and test scores. So typically, if you want to go into government service in civilian capacity, you would take a civil service exam if you wanted to work domestically. If you wanted to work for the State Department, uh, you might take a foreign service exam. And then they put together your exam scores with your work experience, uh, grades, and education, and they assign you to a particular position in the federal bureaucracy. Agency capture is when an agency that's supposed to regulate an industry gets captured by that industry, meaning influenced excessively by that industry. So instead of regulating it, it goes very easy on that industry and it basically winks at what that industry is doing. Why this might happen is because regulators are either bamboozled by indus industries because industries know more about themselves and the regulators can know about them or because regulators are dreaming themselves of positions in the private sector or positions for their nephews and nieces in the private sector and they t tend to go too easy on agencies there's on uh, uh, industries they're supposed to regulate deregulation and re-regulation deregulation is when you reduce regulations as happened for example in case of an airline industry uh, in the 1970s and also in case of the banking industry in the 1990s you uh, eliminate some regulations uh, for the sake of uh, business efficiency and then you re-regulate if you think you have gone too far as in fact had happened with both the airline and banking industries in the 21st century they had to be re-regulated a bit in order to improve uh, actual outcomes sunshine laws um, passed after government in the sunshine act of 1976 uh, basically, it says that uh, federal agencies of certain size have to hold, um, have to maintain a public record of all of the meetings they hold. Uh, sunset laws are those laws that stipulate that an agency or a program will disappear after a certain uh, period of time. Sunset laws were passed as a result of Congress's general reluctance to eliminate agencies and programs after creating them so that instead of existing in perpetuity, these would expire automatically unless Congress renewed them. But guess what? Agencies and programs continue to grow and they are rarely eliminated because what happens is Congress simply renews their mandate, renews their existence instead of allowing sunset laws to simply phase them out automatically. Contracting out is when you contract uh, previously held government services to the private sector. So instead of making it yourself, you ask uh, the private sector to do it. Instead of providing services yourself, you ask the private sector to do it. Uh, in terms of Department of Defense, you see a lot of contracting out. Uh, Department of Defense operates its major pro uh, projects, technological projects, primarily on the basis of contracting out to major private agencies uh, or corporations. So corporations like TRW, Raytheon, McDonnell Douglas, Boeing, Lockheed Martin are the ones that are filling the uh, orders by the Department of Defense. Uh, whistleblowers are people who report illegal or unethical activities within their organizations. Uh, in 1978, there was a Civil Service Reform Act passed to protect whistleblowers. In 1989, it was strengthened with the Whistleblower Protection Act. But what actually happens is, despite 
legal protections that exist on paper, 40% of whistleblowers lose the position that they held with their agency within one year of blowing the whistle. So you take a significant risk when you become a whistleblower. Even though federal uh, employees are rarely fired, if you're a whistleblower, you, you increase drastically your chance of being fired. Enabling legislation is simply a law uh, that Congress passes that authorizes the creation of an administrative agency, specifies its name, purpose, composition, function, and its powers. Government service, or GS, is the government pay scale. It has 15 categories, and, and each category has steps, typically four steps. So after you take your civil service exam, and they take your scores and put it together with your work experience and education in order to try to place you on a pay scale. The pay scale they place you on is this GS pay scale, and you are placed in a category 1 to 15, and the step 1 through 4 within a category, and then based on seniority and performance, you advance higher and higher on the GS scale. Senior Executive Service was created in the late 1970s, um, and this is kind of the cream of the crop, the upper crust of bureaucratic organizations. Uh, people who work for Senior Executive Service get paid a little bit more, uh, but they have a little bit less uh, protection uh, in, in terms of uh, tenure. Uh, they have less merit system protection. And that's it for uh, bureaucracy.